Okay. Uh, welcome to the GADEPS. Uh, today, we are really honored to have, uh, have uh, Fritz Boykers talking in our seminar. And uh, he's going to talk about uh, periods and work congruence. So, Fritz, please go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much, Hossein. And uh, well, thanks everybody for, for joining here. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot see any faces, so I'm just talking to my screen. So, but okay, whatever you want to ask something, please, please make a sound, and then uh, I'll, I'll be happy to to, to reply to your questions. So, uh, the, the 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 lecture of today is a little bit different in the sense that it's more arithmetic than the the, the previous lectures. So, I'm hope I'm, I'm, one of the things I sincerely hope is that you know about periodic numbers uh, and uh, maybe zeta functions, but we'll get to that. But periodic numbers is going to be very important in this, uh, in this lecture. So I hope you're, you're, you're comfortable with that. So the, the work I'll speak about is a uh, recent work we did uh, a few years, the past few years, with, uh, jointly with Masha Flazenko. And, uh, uh, basically, it all started with uh, with Dwork's famous work on the rationality of the, uh, the zeta function of uh, varieties, and uh, so Dwork uh, proved, as you know, Dwork proved the rationality of zeta functions of algebraic varieties, and he also continued uh, and generalized it by studying uh, variations of zeta functions, and uh, in this uh, way he arrived at uh, things like uh, periodic Picard-Fuchs equations. Uh, the, the variations of, uh, of the zeta functions, uh, what is the Frobenius structure of differential equations, etc. Uh, well, we get to some of these things in a moment, but there's one very classical paper by Dwork, which is called, I hope you can see my uh, pointing device. I made it yeah, special for, the, for this lecture. So uh, it's this, a famous article, Periodic Cycles from 19. Uh, uh, 69 and I'll quote one important result uh, which is uh, kind of uh, father of, of all the uh, all the of this whole subject and so what Dwork did was uh, take this uh, Legendre family of uh, elliptic curves given by this equation and as you know you can uh, there's a unique differential holomorphic differential form which you see here and if you take its period, for example, by integration from one up to infinity, uh, well, it becomes a function of t, of course, because this t is a parameter in there. And you, if you expand in t, you get this power series expansion. And that's uh, why you may recognize this as the most classical hypergeometric function uh, that, that everybody knows. So, uh, and I guess also in every uh, book on, uh, on periods of uh, algebraic varieties and uh, picard fuchs equations, etc. This is the first example that people see. However, Dwork did something very interesting with this. Uh, he also had some periodic considerations. Let me show you. So, if we call this function f of t, uh, Dwork defined the truncated sums uh, f m of t, uh, which is simply the same series, but you stop at the term t to the m. So you discard the term t to the m uh, and beyond. So this is the fmt. And then Dork proved, and now I hope that there's on my screen, there's something, there's a text. Do you see that? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. The, the, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. We see. So, yeah, we see. Uh, so there's a theorem, but on my screen, there's something. Oh, wait a minute. No, it's solved. Sorry. It was something that happened on my screen, and I was afraid it would happen to your screen. So, no, but it's fine. Slides, yeah. It's fine. Okay. So this is uh, Dwork's theorem, 1969, and you see that if you take the quotient of this uh, power series f t divided by f t to the p, then modulo any p to the s for any s greater or equal than one. A p is an odd prime, by the way, and it's, it's congruent to uh, this quotient of truncated power series. So you should read this as a congruence of, of power series. And now the, the thing is that uh, what you have here is that this is a quotient 
of power series. And this is basically a rational function. So this gives you a way of approximating this quotient of power series by these rational functions, uh, periodically at least. So mod p to the s for increasing s, that means you get higher and higher approximations. And so basically this was Dwork's discovery that uh, this function ft divided by ft to t to the p is called an analytic element. So it basically is contained in the periodic completion of the rational functions. Now, why is this important? It's important because you would like to uh, substitute values, periodic numbers for this t here. And uh, if you take a t whose absolute value is less than one, then of course this series converges and you can compute the, the numerator and denominator and take the quotient and compute it. But for many applications, you would like to in, uh, uh, substitute a value whose periodic absolute value is equal to one. And then you cannot compute these things separately. However, you can compute this quotient simply by computing uh, these rational functions and taking the periodic limit. And that gives you value. And so this is a kind of periodic analytic continuation to the boundary of the uh, periodic unit disk. So let me uh, go to the next slide and show you a little bit. So this is called an analytic element. It lies in this periodic completion of the rational functions. And now was why was the work interested in this? Namely, we would, as I said, we now would like to substitute values for this t. And these values are going to be in zp, the periodic integers. So we take t0, which is in zp, make a little assumption that this p truncated thing is not zero modulo p. Uh, and there's a, an annoying condition, namely that t0 should be a p minus first root of unity. Well, never mind. The point is that Dwork proved that if you compute the value of this analytic continuation at such a point, you get a periodic unit lambda, and this periodic unit turns out to be, to be a root of the zeta function of the elliptic curve E T0, which I just uh, showed you uh, uh, on the previous slide. So this was basically uh, a formula of Dwork, a kind of an analytic formula for something discrete like uh, a zeta function of, of this uh, variety E, e T0. I'm not sure if I should explain what a zeta function is at this point, uh, but maybe shall I continue? Yeah, yeah, no okay. Uh, okay. So let's see, I had, I had here a sidestep to explain what a zeta function is, but unless somebody hollers now, then I, I'll just continue. Uh, okay, so th this is a little bit annoying. Uh, in, but it, it turns out that you can uh, uh, smoothen this theorem in the following way. Namely, take a t0, which is a periodic uh, integer, uh, take this condition over here, and then it turns out that you can take simply take this limit. So here are the truncations. Divide the truncations and compute it modulo p to the s, and then you get this lambda again modulo p to the s. And of course, as you let s go to infinity, you get approximations for this root of the zeta function of et0. Now, th this is this statement is uh, I haven't really found it in, in Dork's uh, work uh, w w without a constraint. And when I present it to people, they usually say, well, yes, this is OK, but you should have t0 to the p over here. Well, that's not true. Actually, you could take any t0 in cp and this limit will hold true. And so the remarkable thing is that this limit, it's independent. Well, that this elliptic curve mod p depends only on t0 mod p. So the thing is, whatever limit of t0 you take of your t0 mod p, this limit will always be the same. There? It follows from work of Moshe um, and myself, but I guess uh, um, people have also observed it or seen it. Okay, 
So the uh, proof of this is... Uh, well, it's, yes. Hi, Chris. I just wanted to say that uh, in this theorem, it's also F2, the truncation, as in the previous one. There is a little uh, misprint in the second theorem. And this theorem. Uh, Fp of t0 is yeah. periodic. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, here, uh, in the first line, it's yeah. p of t0. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I forgot the p, the subscript p. My yes. apologies. So yeah. we should have this thing over here. This should be over there. So it's polynomial condition, and this fp is called the, the Hasse polynomial. You may have heard of that. And the zeros of the Hasse polynomial are uh, basically the values which are which correspond to super singular elliptic curves. Okay, thank you, Masha. <laughs> okay, so as I said, the proof is not really hard, but usually when you look in the literature, it's cluttered with all sorts of uh, things that are distracting. So what I like to do is uh, give you the uh, the setup that uh, Masha and I developed. So it's a very simple elementary setup that allows you to prove, for example, uh, Dwork's uh, theorem, which you have here, and many generalizations of, uh, of, of similar nature. And I like to, what I like to do in this lecture is to start with this general setup and then show you how you can derive these, uh, uh, th th these consequences, in particular, uh, some generalizations of these theorems. Okay, here we go. Uh, we, we shall work over a, a base ring. And uh, for a base ring, we have two possible choices. Uh, one choice is the, the periodic numbers or the polynomials with periodic coefficients. And, uh, well, just a reminder, whenever we work over ZP, we are basically computing zeta functions. When we work over ZPT, we basically look at deformations of zeta functions. We look at Frobini structures and picard fuchs equations and that's uh, the the consequence of of your choice of ring so this is the choice of ring of course you can choose many other more general rings but for the sake of this presentation i restrict to those two and on this ring we have so-called frobenius lift which is an anamorphism of the ring and basically you know if you look at these things modular p then uh, you, the pth power map is a, a Frobenius uh, anamorphism, and but in these characteristic zero rings, you would like to have a lift of this. So those are anamorphisms of the ring such that this holds. Well, you don't have to remember the full generality. I hope you, it suffices for this lecture to remember that if we take the periodic numbers, sigma is just trivial. It does nothing because then r is r to the p modulo p by Fermat's little theorem. And when R is the polynomial ring, then we can, oh, there should be a P here. I again forgot a, uh, a suffix. So uh, th then we simply take sigma of a polynomial is equal to the same polynomial where T is replaced by T to the P. So this is the base ring. Now we're going to define polynomials. So the basis is a uh, run polynomial. And the zero set is going to be the algebraic variety that we're going to be interested in. So we start with the Laurent polynomial, and uh, the coefficients are in this base ring, ZP, or the polynomial ring. And I use the vector notation, so bold face X to bold face A simply means X1 for X to B. This here means X1 to the B uh, multiplied by the other powers which I hope is familiar to you. And um, well, so it can be a, a, the a Laurent polynomial with n variables. And it has a Newton polytope. And Newton polytope, what is that? Well, simply, you look at the exponent vectors of the terms in this Laurent polynomial, and you take the convex hull of them. So we take all these uh, vectors here, and we take the convex hull of these polynomials. That's called the Newton polytope. Uh, delta zero is the interior, and delta zero z is basically the set of integer points inside the interior. Let me give you an example. So here is uh, our uh, standard uh, running example of this uh, Legendre family of elliptic curves. 
it's a two variable polynomial so of course it's all it's, it's also a round polynomial and uh well i, I here the, the black dots are basically uh the exponent vectors of the terms uh this for example corresponds to y squared and uh, th this one corresponds to x cubed and this corresponds to x and to x squared then the gray part is then the neutral polytope and the uh, in the interior there's only one lattice point which is the point one comma one as you see here and this corresponds to the term x times y and as you observe it's not present in this equation but uh, it's that's not uh, it, it may also have been there so in, in other examples so i hope you have enough example by by this uh, neutral polytope and this will also be kind of a running example throughout uh, th this lecture okay so what are we going to do we're going to look at different variety or maybe on the complement variety it is given by rational functions and these rational functions are the complement denominator here is a monomial and the uh, exponent of the monomial is contained in k times the interior of the newton polytope and uh, this uh, constraint sees to it that basically you can think of these forms as differential forms of this classical kind of the second kind in the classical sense so we're looking at uh, differential forms of the second kind with two small uh, caveats. First caveat is we forget about the. So actually, you should look upon this as an end form where you forget about uh, this wedge product. I don't want to write down these wedge products all the time, so we just forget about them. But so I say rational functions, but in the back of my head, I usually have uh, the word uh, differential form. There's also a, a, a small subtlety here, which is the fact that k minus 1 factorial, and this makes everything run very smoothly if you work over the periodic numbers. And you have to take, take my word on this. Okay, here we go. So you can also take uh, uh, derivatives of these functions. Uh, by derivatives, I do not mean, well, I mean the log derivatives, so the x, i, d, d, x, y's. So if you take the derivatives of the of the rational functions and take their sums, then you get a module over R, which is called D of omega F. And basically, you can uh, see these as the, uh, the the exact forms, right? These are derivatives, and you can uh, identify them with the exact forms. And so you know if you take uh, differential forms, modulo exact forms. Uh, you get a kind of cohomology, and it turns out that this is precisely the nth derived cohomology of the complement of the zero locus of our polynomial f. And uh, then we are in the ordinary algebraic Durand cohomology, and you probably know that if f satisfies uh, sufficient uh, smoothness conditions or delta regularity, then you know that this is a finite dimensional space. Uh, sorry, yes. uh, your differential forms are meromorphic in xi also, but then you claim that it is in the complement of just the zero set of f. Yeah, so, so, so the thing is that uh, the, this differential form that you see here, of, of course, it, it has poles that f is zero. So it lives in the complement of, uh, of the variety zf. Yeah, I, but then dxy divided by x1 also. Um, uh, uh, you mean, oh, you mean th those? Uh, it is x1 and xn also. Or are they are cancelled? Uh, so, so the x1 up to xn, of course, the, uh, they're also poles, but we, uh, it's the nth round probability of t to the n, and this is the, the, the torus, so c star to the n. So, and of okay. course, the. Okay, okay. okay. Yeah, so, so that's the that, that's the reason. So it's it's a kind of a toric approach of a story which you probably know in in, in the the projective case very well. No. Okay, but we shall not go into this. Uh, what we shall do is define a bigger module, and uh, which is uh, this one, 
we're going to define a bigger module which has been introduced by Nick Katz in a paper from the 1980s. And, uh, well, let me give it. So what we're going to do, we're going to look at these rational functions, so the space omega of f, and we're going to uh, form their Laurent expansions. So if you have a multivariable rational function and you want to form a Laurent expansion of it, what you have to do is choose a vertex and then expand. And I'll give you an example. So in the case when f is this, uh, then y squared corresponds to a vertex of the Newton polytope. So this was the top of this uh, triangle. And then we look at this rational function and note this monomial corresponds to uh, the uh, uh, support vector 1 comma 1, which was this uh, white dot which was in the interior of the Newton polytope. So this corresponds to, to choice of an element of omega of f. And uh, so f is this polynomial. We take out the y squared, take it out. So we have this left and the y squared is taken out. And what we're left with is uh, this divided by y squared and this thing inverted. And now you expand this in a geometric series in this way. And there you see the nth powers of this term. And then you expand it further and blah, blah, blah. And at some point, you get a formal a Laurent series expansion that basically, if you take care of your uh, the, the shape of your uh, terms, it's basically is uh, the Laurent series corresponding to the powers of x and y, where the ex um, exponents satisfy uh, these inequalities. So they kind of lie in a kind of cone in a two, uh, two dimensional uh, in two dimensional lattice. And in this case, R is, of course, if it's a variable t, so it will be the uh, polynomials in t. And basically, by taking formal Laurent expansions, you can embed uh, omega of f into this uh, module of formal expansions. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to embed this in these formal expansions. And uh, now, we're also going to look at um, formal exact uh, expansions. I call them formal derivatives. And what are they? Well, precisely the same as with the, uh, the, the rational uh, different derivatives of rational functions. You simply take the derivatives of a formal expansion, take their, their sum, sum of all those uh, derivatives, and that gives you a module that I call D formal. And of course, the things we have seen before, the derivatives of the rational functions, well, you can make their formal expansions, and of course they're contained in there, but at the same time they are rational functions, so they're also contained in the rational functions. So it's this set here that you see. Now, this module is something very interesting. So it consists of rational functions, and, uh, uh, but, but, uh, but the rational functions uh, whose who formal expansions are derivatives. And uh, Katz calls them uh, differential forms that die on expansion. That's a very dramatic uh, terminology. But uh, the nice thing is that it's very easy to recognize the derivative of formal expansion if you meet one. So here's a lemma by Katz, which is completely elementary, and says that if I have a formal expansion, formal Laurent series here, the AKs are elements of the ring. And they're in this, uh, they are formal, uh, um, formal derivative, if and only if the coefficients satisfy certain congruences. And these congruences, well, the, 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 the exponents of these congruences correspond to the indices k here. Uh, well, you can try to uh, uh, decipher this, uh, this lemma. I can also give you. Uh, an example of how it works. Namely, if you start with a, an arbitrary formal expansion and take its derivative, for example, the first derivative, then of course, uh, this will be this, uh, you do the differentiation term-wise, and each term gives you uh, a term of this form. And you see that the exponent k1 of x1 has come down because of the derivation. 
Well, now you see that this is, of course, divisible by K1. Well, essentially, it's then, of course, also divisible by P to the power, the ort P of K1. So the, the number of prime factors P that are contained in K1. And um, that makes a lot of sense, I hope. And uh, well, that, that this is just a general version of this idea. So if you take derivatives on formal expansion, you get coefficients that have the divisibility properties by P and you can immediately recognize them. So that's a very easy way to recognize uh, derivatives, much easier than recognizing derivatives of rational functions. So now Katz's idea was basically to consider uh, these differential forms or these rational functions omega of f modulo uh, these derivatives, these formal derivatives. So here you go. Oh, one technicality. And before we the theorem, uh, let's G. So, so we're going to, in the general case, uh, this uh, Newton polytope of the polynomial has uh, integer points in the interior. And from uh, the, these points in the interior, we're going to construct G by G matrix. So G is the number of points of lattice points in the interior of the Newton polytope. We're going to follow, create this matrix beta of P and the coefficients are give, given simply by taking suitable coefficients of the P minus first power of the poly polynomial that we started with. So there's G matrix beta of P. Uh, you may have heard of this uh, matrix before. It's called the Hasselbeck matrix corresponding to F. Okay, now I can formulate the, uh, the theorem, which is in uh, one of these two references that I gave in the, uh, the abstract. Uh, suppose that the determinant of uh, beta of this uh, is not divisible by P, then this question modules of modulo the uh, derivatives is free and generated by the forms that arise from the lattice points in the interior of the Newton polytope of F. As these are these forms, namely the, the denominator occurs only in the first power, and these uh, Exponent vectors here are all contained in the interior of the Newton polytope. This module uh, is not defined over R. We have to extend the ring R a little bit, and I won't pay too much attention to it, but just mention it once. Namely, if this is the ring we started with, you have to adjoin one over the determinant of uh, the Hasselbeck matrix and then take the piadic completion. So this little hat stands for uh, piadic completion. So this is really a piadic business that we're looking at here. So this is the first theorem. And uh, well, the thing that, uh, that Masha and I both like about it is that there are no regularity conditions of F. So there are no non-singularity conditions. This holds for any polynomial F. Even if the polynomial is reducible, then this theorem, well, if this is satisfied, uh, will hold. And and uh, you know, if, if instead of this, you have the, uh, the derivatives of the rational functions, so you have the ordinary Duran cohomology, this is very doubtful that you need all these conditions, um, the, 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 the variety. Okay, so this is uh, basically the first uh, uh, questions so far. Uh, okay, so here's the, here's an example, the, the running example. Then in the running example, the uh, as I said, there's only one interior point in the Newton polytope, and the generator should of course be x, y divided by f, which is then the only generator in that case. So that will be one dimensional uh, rank one module. Uh, okay. Just one question. So, uh, the, yes. Uh, the generators are independent of the prime p, no? As I far as I uh, the generators, uh, yes, true, true. But p has to satisfy the condition that uh, this is not that the determinant of the Hasselbeck matrix is not divisible by p. 
Yeah, but I mean, if I am uh, really following, but this module, which is come something like uh, the RAM uh, cohomology, it's, it's dependent on the P or yeah, the, the, uh, uh, I should maybe correct you. It's a module over something that depends on P. Ah, uh, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's a module over this uh, periodic completion, which, uh, is, which strongly depends on P. So, okay. So, uh, yes. It looks as if it's the same thing, but the rings are, are different for, for, the, okay. for the different modules. Okay, so uh, now we get to something, uh, or we need things like Frobenius, and uh, that we like to uh, introduce the Cartier operator. Uh, you may have seen this before, the Cartier operator on uh, Laurent series. is a very sim simple operator. You take a Laurent series, and uh, you replace the a k by a p, p times k. That's all that happens. That's the uh, Cartier operator on a uh, formal Laurent series. Okay. It has two very uh, it has two properties. First property is that on uh, exact formal derivatives, formal derivatives, uh, it works. Uh, it sends formal derivatives to formal derivatives. And moreover, it sends formal derivatives to p times formal derivatives. And that's because of the derivation that takes place in there. And it's, uh, well, you can, I don't want to write it down, but it's very easy to, to check this. There's a second thing. This, uh, by embedding this omega of f embeds in the formal uh, power series, so you can apply CP. And then it turns out that the image, again, of a rational, of the uh, Laurent series of a rational function, is again a rational function, but not quite uh, with denominator f or denominator power of f. But you can show that the Cartier operator sends these rational functions to these rational functions where f is replaced by f sigma. And okay, and f sigma is basically the f where the coefficients um, have, have undergone the Frobenius substitution. Uh, the hat always means a periodic completion. So uh, the periodic completion of these uh, uh, rational functions to the periodic completion of these rational functions, that's what CP does. Well, the theorem is elementary, but uh, it, it takes a bit, it takes a computation, which is not very hard. And it's a theorem of, in, in one of our uh, papers. Okay, so can see now that uh, this quotient, this finite rank quotient is mapped to this finite rank quotient. And uh, then, of course, it's a, a map from uh, uh, finite rank modules, which has a corresponding matrix. We call this matrix lambda. And uh, well, it's the, well, the entries are, are called uh, this. And so uh, th this, I hope you recall these, these omega u's. Uh, these are the omega u's. These are the, the basis of this uh, of this module. Yeah. So, well, strictly speaking, it's a transpose of this action, but uh, never mind that. So, lambda is then a, a g times g matrix, and uh, well, by some classical arguments of Dwork, you can show that the when you work over the periodic integers, the characteristic polynomial of lambda divides the zeta function of f which is very convenient. And uh, so this is all parts, uh, part of Dwork's work on the, this computation of the, of the zeta function. Okay, now, over uh, when R is ZPT with the polynomial ring, then we get other interesting phenomena that have to do with picard fuchs equations, and we'll get to that in a moment. So, uh, Fred, uh, yes. Uh, in your main example, so this is this characteristic, but I mean, this is just one, and then you have one, one function. Absolutely. So th th this lambda is then precisely this ft divided by ft to the p. So th then it's a, uh, yes, yeah, so, so it's a one by one matrix here. And so the cp of this one form is lambda times the one form with, uh, uh, with a sigma here. There should be a sigma there. Um, and, 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 and that gives you precisely the, the thing we had in the very beginning. And it will turn out that this uh, lambda, which has only one element, is simply ft divided by ft to the p. 
I think. But we'll see, we'll see that later also. So I, I'll come back to that. Okay, so here's a, so here's a generalization of the Hasselbeet polynomial. So instead of a sub, uh, subscript v, uh, P, we have an M here. Uh, the rest is the same, so we get G times C matrices. And there's a theorem of uh, Masha from 2016, uh, which uh, says this, that if this determinant is uh, not divisible by P, uh, let G, let lambda be the G times G matrix of the Cartier operator, then this congruence holds for all S's greater or equal than one. So and as you let S go to infinity, you see that this is a kind of approximation formula for the matrix lambda by uh, this times the inverse of these uh, uh, of these other. Uh, so, the, so this matrix times the inverse of the sigma of this matrix, I should say. So these are have polynomial entries, and therefore you can again see that this lambda is approximated by rational functions, much the same way as I showed in the very beginning of this uh, this lecture. Well, at a time when uh, Masha proved this theorem, uh, only the, the existence of lambda was known, and so it's a consequence of the of, of the work that we did later is that we can now identify this lambda. So, but I just simply put it into uh, Masha's theorem. And uh, the nice thing is that also this also gives you a way to compute lambda to give uh, periodic approximations of this uh, Cartier matrix uh, lambda simply by computing these generalized Hasselbeet matrices. I wanted to give you uh, two examples uh, of, uh, of this congruence to, to get an illustration of what I told you to make things more concrete, but time is flying by. Okay, let's... Well, in particular, if S is one, we get beta P here, and uh, P uh, beta of one here is simply the identity matrix. So. Uh, for S is one, then uh, you get that beta of P modulo P, so the Hasselbeet matrix modulo P is equal to this Cartier matrix. Okay, here's an example. I simply take the polynomial, a one variable polynomial, and uh, Newton polytope is a line segment from the, the point zero to the point three. It has two interior points, one and two, corresponding to x and x squared. And beta m, if we follow the recipe from the previous page, but don't bother to uh, decipher, to, 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 to parse that, I'll just give you the answer. You take this polynomial f raised to the power n minus one, and then in one, one place take this coefficient, and the other places take these coefficients of these monomials. Here's an example. If you take the prime 151, and uh, this computation gives you this matrix modulo 151. Uh, well, this matrix doesn't look like much. However, if you take the uh, the, the, the characteristic equation of this uh, matrix, you simply get t squared plus t plus 1. And this corresponds to the zeta function of, uh, well, it basically corresponds to the point count of the number of points modulo 151 of this polynomial. And I think this corresponds to, well, I'm not sure what it corresponds to. So let me not say anything. So it corresponds to a certain number of points on uh, a certain number of uh, zeros of the polynomial modulo 151. I think you should take the trace and then add one. So I guess it's, uh, well, I, I'll not say anything. So, <laughs> okay, similarly, uh, it turns out that if you compute these uh, matrices, they don't look like, uh, they look a bit like garbage. However, their uh, characteristic polynomials are clearly uh, things of the shape that correspond to zeta functions of this uh, uh, polynomial f. Okay, I had another example, but uh, because of time, maybe I should not do this. This is a, an example where I take a, a genus two curve but uh, perhaps um, I should skip this. Anyway, at the end, uh, yeah, no, I'll skip it, forget it. What I'd like to do is uh, go to uh, Dwork's theorem that I uh, 
gave you in the beginning and uh, give it, well, prove a generalization of it. And uh, by using the setup of, uh, of Masha and, and my, in, in our paper. So uh, here's a theorem that is proven by uh, uh, Masha and, and Tom Mallet. And uh, it goes like this. If you start with a Laurent polynomial, coefficients in ZP, and suppose that uh, zero is a unique lattice point in the interior of the Newton polytope. Uh, you recognize this is a, uh, you may recognize as a typical situation which people call the Calabiao situation. Okay, so now for you raise this polynomial to the power n, and then you take the constant term. And uh, you do it for all n, and then take the generating function of these numbers fn and call it f, much like the f we had from the beginning. There's also the truncated version that you see here. And then, 2016, uh, Melitev Lazenko showed that we have uh, um, a congruence which is precisely the same as Dwork's congruence, uh, congruence, but then for this particular function f. So this is a kind of generalization. And in fact, if you take the special polynomial one fourth times this, we can recover Dwork's theorem, more or less. So now th this theorem was proven in a certain uh, 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 manner in that paper. However, uh, what I'd like to show you is that this uh, theorem is also an almost an immediate consequence of the things that I've showed you before. So it, it, we saw two theorems from this preprints of uh, Masha and myself. And uh, for example, this congruence follows rather uh, in, in an almost direct way. Um, and by the way, there's something more general if you it can even be more done, done more generally, but I'll not go into that. So how do we go? Uh, how do you do this? We do it in the following way, namely, you need a variety. Essentially, well, we need a family of varieties, and we do it by taking the polynomial equal to one minus t times g. So this will be, the zero set of this will be a family of Calabiao varieties. Uh, there's only one interior point. This was our, our assumption. So that means that this module, uh, the module that we have, module of the uh, formal, exact formal uh, expansions, has rank one and is generated by one over f. The one is here because one is a monomial with support zero, zero. And of course, it's generated by that. Now you can expand one over f in powers of t. Uh, so this f becomes this, and then you take the geometric series expansion. And what you now can do is the constant terms on both sides. Well, it's not clear how to take constant terms uh, of one over f, but it is clear how to take constant terms here, namely uh, the constant term of gx to the n. We had defined this to be uh, fn. Then we get the generating series of the fn's, and we had agreed to call this f of t. So it means that basically we can interpret this f of t, this uh, as the constant term of one over f, and what you see here is basically uh, a period computation. Recall that one over f well, is essentially a differential form, and taking the constant term is simply taking the integration of this differential form over uh, circles uh, in uh, x1 up to xn coordinates. So this is basically a period computation, and the period of uh, the differential form corresponding to one over f is simply f of t. That's what this computation shows here. Okay. Uh, our theorem also says that there exists a lambda such that the Cartier operator applied to, uh, sorry, uh, a Cartier operator applied to one over f is, well, there exists a lambda t such that it's equal to one over f sigma, and f sigma is, uh, well, simply it's the same as before, except that t is replaced by t to the p. And much along the formal derivatives, uh, we have this equality. We know that there exists such a lambda t. Uh, well, we need, for the continuation of the story, we need uh, refinement, which is extra p. So this p does not come from the theorem that I showed you before, 
but you need an extra environment to get this extra p. But never mind that. So what we can do now is take constant terms to both sides. Well, if you take the constant term of this, Cartier does nothing to the constant term. It just keeps it. So if you take the constant term, you can forget about the Cartier. I simply take the constant term of 1 over f, and we have seen that it's equal to f of t. Take the constant term of this, and then, we go, of course, with f, well, not f t, but f t to the p, because there's a t to the p inside this f sigma. So we get this. So we find f t minus lambda t times this is equal to, and now comes the nice thing, constant terms of derivatives are always zero. So it's zero. And we conclude that this multiplication factor here, lambda t is, is f t times f t to the p. And I think this was precisely our science question, namely, what is this factor in the one dimensional case? Well, it's simply this, uh, this quotient. I hope this, this answers your question uh, now in this case. Uh, so this is our conclusion. Now we have the, uh, now we know what this uh, lambda t is, and now we can go on to prove the congruence. And for this congruence, we can take again uh, periods, but not uh, exact periods, but periods modulo integers. And these integers are going to be prime powers, but for the powers of p, but for a moment, I'll just take our arbitrary ends. And the trick is now, it's a, it's a little gadget, basically. You take this uh, differential form, multiply by this. Let's do it. You have this, and this is 1 over f. And now you see that this is really tailored to, uh, to see to it that this division is possible. And namely, this is an elementary division that turns out to be polynomial in g of x. Is this polynomial? Now, if you take constant term on both sides, you get that the constant term of this is equal to the constant term of this. Well, the constant terms of this are the, still the fn's. And here's this finite sum. This is truncated ft, which you find there. So this is the, uh, the trick to produce the truncated uh, uh, fts. Now we're going to apply this idea of this, 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 this multiplication by this and then take constant term to this identity that follows from this theorem of Masha and mine. So here's this theorem again. And now we simply multiply by this. Uh, so you see that the m is now this. Uh, well, we don't have, we have p to the s here, which is so essentially we have p times m here. But so we multiply by this, and then we take constant terms. So we're going to there are three things to be computed. So multiply by on this. Do the computation of this and the computation, a multiplication of this, this, and then again, do a multiplication. And it will turn out that uh, we cannot do the exact uh, computation. However, it is possible to do the computation modulo p to the s. So what I'd like to do now is do it step, take it step by step. So first multiply this with this, and then take the constant term. Here we go. So we've multiplied the C of P of this by this, and uh, then we're going to take the constant term. But not yet. We're going to uh, move this factor inside the Cartier operator. And if you do this, this is possible at the cost of replacing x by x to the p. So you get x to the p here. And this is a strict, uh, this is an exact equality. And that's very tempting to take this p outside to get a p to the s over here. And it is possible, however, not exactly, but it's possible modulo p to the s. So let's do that. And now you find this uh, one minus uh, thing we have seen before with an m, but now m is p to the s, multiplication of this. And if you want to take the constant term, well, for the constant term, cp doesn't matter. And the constant term, is, we know, is the trunk to the s. And that's a nice little we take constant term and p to the s. So that's the first computation. So this gives f p to the s. Now we move over here. I'm 
multiply this with this thing. Multiply this with this. As well, what was that? Well, it was one minus e to the p. And this is, uh, well, it's, it's visible, so we get this uh, polynomial computation. And again, and then if you look very closely, you see you have precisely this polynomial. Okay, so we go back, and then we uh, multiply this with an element over here. Take constant terms, well, take a typical, uh, typical exact uh, formal derivative. Uh, uh, we say, let's say, p times the derivative of eta, where eta is a, a formal power series expansion. This is the derivative, and the p is from, because we have p over there. And, uh, well, we just multiply this whole thing with that uh, crazy factor. And uh, now, the nice thing is, we can take this one inside the derivative, because one is a constant. We also would like to take this thing inside the derivative, but of course you cannot do it, because you have Leibniz rule. However, if you consider everything p to the s minus 1, and with this extra p, it becomes p to the s. So if you consider everything modular p to the s, you can take it inside there. Then you find that basically modular p to the s, this product is again a form, formal uh, derivative. And you know that the constant term of that is equal to 0. And so we get 0 modular p to the s. And the upshot of everything, so this is the result of the first computation, the second computation, and the third computation. And there you find uh, this congruence, where this lambda we had seen before is simply ft divided by f 2 dp. Now, if you look closely, you find precisely the result that Dwork also gave, but for that particular power series, f of t. And now you can see that it uh, arises by simply taking uh, periods and periods, well, uh, clever periods, uh, modulo uh, powers of p. Okay, and now if you want to do uh, uh, substitute values in, you can do the same story again. So if you now suppose special, take a specialization, so you take T0, a periodic number uh, with this condition, then uh, our theorem gives us that there exists a lambda zero, which is a root the zeta function of this variety, such that cp1 over f is equal to this. That's what our theorem gives. Now, exactly the same competition. The, the, the thing is now that um, we don't have exact periods anymore uh, because there is no t running around. We have made the substitution, so this parameter t is not running around, so we cannot do this uh, formal expansion in t. So there are no periods, exact periods anymore, but we can still perform the trick with the periods modulo p to the s. And then this is the result. After application of the periods modulo p to the s, we obtain this congruence. And this is precisely the congruence which allows you, well, which, which basically gives you an approximation of the uh, unit root of the zeta function of this variety um, uh, in, in terms of these quotients. So this is uh, basically a, a proof of the, the theorems that we started with, except that it's now in a much wider uh, setting. OK. Uh, I think I'm at the end. OK. Thank you for your <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Well, as uh, okay. have all this, but, uh, okay. Yeah. Any question? Let me. Okay, maybe. Oh, you know that we have two official two sessions for questions. One is uh, recorded, the other one not. Uh -huh. <laughs> maybe uh, about uh, this. Uh, I mean, uh, the work theorem. In the same uh, uh, article of book, also some statement about the. Not high, not uh, how to say, uh, the logarithmic solution of the corresponding uh, differential uh, Gauss differential. So, which, so which solution? No, I, I, I mean, every, no, I, I just I just misheard a word. Of you. The, no, which, which solution? The logarithmic solution of the Gauss uh, logarithmic of the log solutions. Ah, that's a good I, question. The work uh, has some statement about the combination of these two. Uh, there are some statement 
about the other stations about this one. And the people in uh, yes. Cuba mentioned that physics, they have used this one in yes. order to prove uh, its integrality. Okay. Yes. I don't so know if, if, you, uh, yeah. if, if, if you take the log solution, if, if you take the log solution, if you take the log solution, uh, divide by the power series solution, and exponentiate that, you get something that people call the mirror map. Right? Yeah, exactly. Okay, so and then the statement is that the coefficients of that are, are integers. Yeah, but this is a <laughs> of the theorem of the work. Uh, there is a congruence uh, between this uh, logarithmic solution divided by f. There is yeah. some oper there is uh, the work operator on the coffee on the on the ABC of the hypergeometric function, and then again there is this t to the p. Uh, if you want to, I see. I see. Uh, I show you. I show you the theorem. Just a moment. Uh, okay. Not technology. <laughs> Just a well, we can, you can you can put it on screen if you want. To. So I. I, uh, I, 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 I have already in my book. Uh, just a moment. Just a moment. Uh, the, yeah. 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 Sorry. I, I can stop presenting and then you can present. No, actually, I can present also. But, uh, yeah. Uh, this, this okay. my, uh, one moment. One moment. If it doesn't work, I will. Uh, I will. Do. So this is a. Uh, well, maybe should, for me, you should move it up a little bit because now I don't see it. Okay. Maybe the, so. If yeah. you write uh, this, this f is the holomorphic solution, and then f plus z log z. I'm reading yes. z. Then g. Then and if this is the logarithmic solution, then there is some congruence. Uh, uh, g divided by f. Uh, there is this operator delta p acting on the parameters and uh, z to the yeah, also, yeah. You, you're, you're looking at more general hypergeometric equations, I think. No, this is also, I mean, you can put it just the Gauss hypergeometric equation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but with a, a, b, and c parameters, I, I, I only looked at uh, half, half, one, but, ah, but you're okay. looking at a, 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 b, c, if I understand correctly. And, and there's, if, yes, there's a similar theory in there. Yeah. yeah but so, after, uh, okay, there so maybe, maybe I should answer your question. It's uh, so, so that this this log solutions that they're not really in our our work uh, because we're still struggling how to, to see how to to deal with them. I see. I see. So the, 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 these holomorphic solutions, well, they arise very easily by uh, uh, you know just uh, expansions and basically you're doing period computations. Uh, how to get the log C? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. It's, it's something I would like to know. Uh, okay. Okay, any, any other question? So let's just I stop recording. <laughs> uh.